Good evening, uh, everyone, uh, from uh, from friends from ASEAN countries, and uh, good afternoon to uh, our speaker, uh, Professor Manuel Dibes, and uh, other friends from Europe. And good morning uh, to people from United States. So it's really my great pleasure today to welcome uh, my friend uh, Manuel Dibes uh, from. Uh, Thales Lab in Orsay in Paris. Uh, we know, uh, I think, each other for a very long time. And he's very well known uh, in the community, so I, I really don't need to introduce him, but as a matter of formality, I would say a few lines about his academic career. Uh, so Manuel Ribes uh, is now working as a CNRS research director at Thales and also associated to the uh, University of uh, Paris Saclay. He has received his PhD in 2001 from the University of uh, Autonoma de Barcelona in Spain and the uh, INSA Toulouse. So it's a joint, uh, I think, a degree from France and Spanish. And he worked uh, for his thesis on manganite interfaces um, at the Institute de Ciencia and Material de Barcelona. Then he uh, moved to uh, Thales, where he is presently now and worked with the Nobel Prize winner for Salbert Ford uh, for about two years on magnetic tunnel junctions. And in 2003, he became a CNRS scientist and joined the Institute for Fundamental Electronics, now known as C2M, at the University of Paris Sud in Orsay. And four years later, uh, later he returned to the CNRS Thales lab uh, to develop research lines on oxides for electronics and spintronics. In 2014, he was promoted as a CNRS research director. Uh, he has done outstanding and phenomenal work in this field, and because of which he has got many, many awards. I will just say a few. He's the recipient of the EU40 prize for the European Material Research Society in 2013. He's a fellow of the American Physical Society and a laureate of an European Research Council Consolidated Grant Mint in 2014 to explore the physics of new electronic phases appearing at oxide interfaces. In 2017, Manuel received the Desarquette Williams Award of the French Academy of Science and the Royal Academy of Netherlands. In 2018, the Frederick Wilhelm Bessel Award of the Alexander Humboldt Foundation. And in 2019, he was awarded an ERC Advanced Grant Fresco to explore spin charge interconversion in spin orbitronics architectures based on ferroelectric materials. And uh, in 2018, he has been listed as a highly cited researcher by Climate Analytics. Uh, yeah. So with this very basic, uh, very simple introduction, Manuel, I welcome you to this seminar. Many, many thanks for finding time uh, to give a seminar to this community. So on behalf of my organizing team uh, and my co-convener, Dr. Brazilsan Singh and other uh, colleagues, uh, Kuspendra, Sakti, and uh, Ajay, and, um, and all the community, basically, I uh, thank you sincerely for joining us. Uh, I just want to tell uh, the audience that during the lecture, we don't take questions. Um, after Manuel gives his talk, we will take some questions. So you can kindly write uh, in chat box your question, or just say, I have a question, or raise your hand, and I will take the questions at the end. So with this, thank you, Manuel, and it's all yours. So please start your lecture. Looking forward. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Wankar, for the invitation and the nice introduction. So it's my pleasure to, to be here with you, to share my work with uh, people from, uh, from India and all around the world. And I, I think this uh, initiative of organizing this periodic seminar is uh, really great. So I, I want to talk to you about today uh, about this uh, strontium titanate based two decks for ultra low power spintronics, and this is a work that we've been um, doing for uh, at least four years with uh, collaborators in many places. And I want to uh, thank mostly the young people who make this possible: Sarah, Felix, Diogo, Paul, Anika, Borger, Julian, Luis, and Srijani. So uh, I want to start this presentation by uh, showing you this, this chart that you probably know. This is the power consumption of uh, information communication technology systems over time. So this is where we are. And uh, this it is projected from this paper 
that uh, uh, in principle, uh, if things continue business as usual, within in 2030, uh, ICT will amount, will consume more than 20% of the total electricity produced on the planet. So this is of course not sustainable and uh, we have to do something about it. So this is a major concern for all of us, but in particular to the main uh, microelectronics companies and that have been working for many years to try to find ways to reduce the energy consumptions of ICT. And one system that was proposed recently by Intel uh, that you may know about is the so-called MESO transistor. MESO stands for magnetoelectric spin orbit logic. It's a non-volatile uh, logic device that uh, is based on spin and involve a number of uh, quantum materials, which I think is a very interesting opportunity for uh, the whole field. So uh, I'm going to explain to you briefly how it works. So the core of the device is a ferromagnetic element whose magnetization can point towards you uh, or towards me. And at the input, uh, it sits on a magnetoelectric element, can be a multiferroic like a bitmen ferrite that is going to be used to um, uh, switch the electrically switch the direction of the magnetization through magnetoelectric coupling. And in the output, there is a spin orbit element that is used to read out the spin information, the, the, the information stored by the ferromagnet. So this device, according to the Intel people, has a number of advantages over CMOS. In particular, it should consume up to 30 times less power than CMOS of the same size when embedded in architectures. And uh, it can work as a majority gate. I mean, it has a number of advantages that are described in that paper and in the supplementary material. Uh, importantly, it has to operate at 100 millivolts. So uh, the magnetoelectric must switch at 100 millivolts and the output must generate 100 millivolts so that the devices can be um, uh, organized in chain. It can be chained together, concatenated, and uh, thereby reducing a lot of power consumption. So the output, which we uh, will be talking about today, is based on the spin orbit uh, system. Uh, it can be a layer of platinum, but most efficiently, uh, it will be better if uh, it is an interface system in which the conversion from the spin information into the charge information is a, a accomplished through the inverse Ehlers-Tan effect. And uh, as I will show you, oxide electrode structures can contribute to the realization of this device. And we are collaborating with Intel to that because they are producing spin to charge conversion with very high efficiencies. So the system that I will focus on mostly during the talk is um, strontium titanate two decks that are typically uh, realized. So two decks stand for two dimensional electron gas, of course. And they are realized by depositing an epitachial layer of lanthanum aluminate. This is done by pulse laser deposition. And this was discovered in 2004 by Akira Atomo and Haru Wang. And this came first as a big surprise because these two materials taken in the vidury are wide band gap insulators. But nevertheless, due to a charge catastrophe scenario, charge reconstruction, uh, strontium titanate is doped in electrons when the interface is built, which makes it conducting and forms the two day. So several years ago, we uh, imaged the two day in cross section and we confirmed that it is very thin, that is really two dimensional, just a few nanometers in thickness. And also uh, us and other uh, authors uh, realized that it, this two day has a number of interesting uh, functionalities. It has a high electromobility, few thousands, few tens of thousands even at low temperature. It is superconducting down to uh, up to 200 millikelvin more or less. Its resistance can be strongly gated. So you can apply the back gate and change the resistance of the two deck by more than one order of magnitude. Gating can also tune the, the superconducting TC and suppress superconductivity. And more importantly for us today, it shows a sizable rush bar spin orbit coupling. And I will explain what this is in the next slide. And this was first observed through a weak until localization in magnetoresistance resistance measurements. And it was also found that the, the rush bar coefficient, which quantifies the efficiency of the, the, the amplitude of the spin orbit coupling in the systems, strongly depends on the gate voltage. 
So the Rashba spin orbit coupling is a manifestation of spin orbit interaction that occurs in systems where uh, uh, inversion symmetry is broken. So this can be at the surface or at an interface, for instance. And you can see here the Rashba Hamiltonian. Alpha r is the Rashba coefficient. And then you have this mixed product between the spin, the momentum, and z, which is uh, the electric field, uh, the, the direction typically perpendicular to the, the plane, perpendicular to the plane of the interface. So because to minimize the energy, the spins and the momentum have to be perpendicular to each other. And this results in the lifting of the spin de de degeneracy of the bands. So the uh, parabolic band that was degenerate in spin is then separated, split it into two parabolic bands with uh, different spin directions. And if you take a cross section at the Fermi level, you have two circular uh, Fermi surfaces. And on each Fermi surface, the spin is going to be perpendicular to the momentum due to this so-called spin momentum locking. And the chirality of the spin contour is going to be, for instance, uh, counterclockwise for the outer contour and clockwise for the inner contour. The sign clockwork or clockwise or counterclockwise uh, depends on the, um, on the sign of the Rajba coefficient. So this was uh, proposed in 1994. And a few years later, it was uh, proposed that um, this system can be used to convert uh, charge current into spin current. So how does this work? Suppose you uh, uh, inject a charge current into such a Rashba system, you are going to shift slightly as you do so the, the Fermi contours. And this is going to generate an extra density of spin up for the outer contour and an extra density of spin down for the inner contour, which are not equivalent, so they don't compensate. And at the end of the day, you have the generation of a finite spin density, which can then diffuse in an adjacent layer. And so thereby you have the conversion of a charge current into a spin current. So this is called the Ehlerstein effect proposed in the beginning of the 90s. And you have also the uh, reciprocal effect, which is the inverse Ehlerstein effect. Here you inject a spin current and you are going to pick up a charge current. So when you inject a spin current, for instance, by spin pumping, I will explain later what this technique is, you create a, an excess of, of spins on one contour uh, on one side of the first contour and on the other side of the other contour. And this causes shifts of delta K, but these shifts are inequivalent again, because these contours don't have the same KF. And so this causes a finite delta K, which corresponds to the generation of a charge current. So this is the universal Einstein effect. And it was uh, demonstrated much later, 2013 by uh, colleagues from my lab uh, in bismuth silver interfaces. So I'm going to talk a lot about this effect. So I want to say a few words about it, a little bit more about it. So the figure of merit that quantifies the conversion efficiency is called lambda. So it's the ratio of the 2D charge current, which is produced over the 3D spin current, which is injected. So because you have a 2D and a 3D currents here, this, is, uh, this has a dimension of a length. So it's called the Edelstein length, lambda IEE. And it is proportional to the Rushback coefficient and to the momentum relaxation times. So in this case, when you are uh, injecting spins along Y, the charge current is going to be generating along X. The um, uh, presence of a rush by spin orbit coupling uh, has another consequence that can also realize spin to charge interconversion by another mecha mechanism, which is called the 2D spin hole effect. So basically when you inject a current and you shift your contours, the spins is not going to be any, any longer exactly perpendicular to the, to the momentum. It was at the equilibrium, but when you shift, it's no longer exactly perpendicular to the momentum. And as a consequence, it wants to recover its equilibrium position perpendicular to momentum. And to do that, it's going to start to process about the local Rushba field, which is setting the direction along which it has to align. And as it does this precision, it acquires a small out of plane component. So there's a spin component along Z, which is produced by this 2D spin hole effect. And this uh, sign of this Z component is opposite for one side or the other side of the Fermi contour. And so this creates a spin current 
uh, with the spins pointing along Z. So here, the figure's merit is a spin hole angle because you are injecting a 2D charge current and producing a 2D spin current. So these are of the same dimension. And uh, importantly here, the, the geometry is a bit different. So uh, uh, they will be important in the, uh, towards the end of the talk. So this is the other end of the talks. First, I'm going to talk about spin to charge conversion, then about charge to spin. Then I will talk about um, uh, spin charge interconversion using the 2D spin hole effect in uh, planar nano devices. And then I will introduce fair electricity as a new degree of freedom in spin to charge conversion that can lead to uh, new types of devices in spintronics. So first let's talk about spin to charge conversion. So we need to inject a spin uh, current. And for that, we are going to use a ferromagnet that we deposit on top of LAOSTO. And uh, we use uh, the technique of spin pumping. So basically we put the sample in a microwave cavity, we, we send a micro, microwave signal, and we um, uh, scan the magnetic field until we reach ferromagnetic resonance. And at ferromagnetic resonance, the magnetization is going to start to process. And that is thus so, it is going to eject, the ferromagnet is going to eject a spin current that will be injected into the neighboring material, which is here the today. And then spin to charge conversion is going to convert the spin current into a charge current, which we will pick up with transverse voltage contacts that are shown here. So these are the results. We see that uh, this is the signal corresponding to ferromagnetic resonance, which occurs at a field a little bit lower than one kilo octet. And exactly at that field, we see that we pick up a, a, a large charge voltage which uh, has a very clear Lorentzian shape, symmetric Lorentzian shape, which is exactly what we expect. And importantly, when we reverse the direction of the magnetic field, so we switch the direction of the magnetization, the sign of the signal ch changes. So we are really converting spins pointing towards you into positive current or spins pointing towards me into negative current. So we are really able to detect, uh, to convert spin information to charge information to detect in a bipolar way, the spin information. This is what is needed for the uh, mesotransistor. transistor. So what was very puzzling uh, after we got this first result is what happened when we applied the gate voltage. So I told you that when we apply the gate voltage, we can tune the properties of this today. Basically what happens is that we change the position of the Fermi level in the band structure we accumulate or deplete carriers. This moves the Fermi level up or down. And uh, we found that the, the, the amplitude and even the sign of the spin to charge conversion signal was very completely was depending very strongly on the gate. You see that at negative gate voltages, in the depleted state, we have a positive signal. And then as we cross over to the positive gate, we have a change of sign and the maximum here at plus one hundred and twenty. So this is very unique. We knew that the brushback coefficient was somehow dependent on the gate, but uh, I mean, this, this change of sign was really unexpected. Another unexpected result was the efficiency of the effect. So the amplitude of the conversion effect was extremely high on the order of a few nanometers, which was about one order, one order magnitude higher than this basement silver interface and comparable or higher than in topological insulators. So why is that? In fact, this was quite surprising in a priori because the rushback coefficient of this uh, two deck is not very high because you don't have very heavy elements. But what is important to remember is that the rushback, the Edelstein lens depends also on the momentum relaxation time, which here is much longer than in bismuth silver interfaces. Here, typically it's on the order of a one picosecond while in bismuth silver, because it's a metallic system, it's typically 10 femtoseconds, so 100 times lower. So if you make an estimate, uh, you can find more or less that the value you should expect from the value of the rushback coefficient and the momentum relaxation time is on the order of a few nanometers, exactly what we measure. So then we, we, we continue this experiment with a slightly different system, and we try to do uh, to understand what is the origin of this strong gate dependence and the change of sign. So for that, we work with slightly different samples in which 
the two deg is defined by the, 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 the deposition of an aluminum layer onto STO. And this makes it possible to generate two decks with slightly higher carry densities. So we, the Fermi level is a little bit higher in the band structure. Similarly, we grow permaloy, we perform spin pumping, and we pick up a large symmetric signal corresponding to the inverse Edelstein effect. And you see again that depending on the gate voltage, we have changes of the amplitude and again of the sign. And we did that for all gate voltaging, and we see that we have an even more complicated gate dependence with a different maximum, the positive and negative maximum, and changes of sign. The result that I showed you before for LAUST were probably more or less in that range when we have a positive effect at uh, low carrier density, then the change of sign, and then this maximum. Now you can see we are able to access this whole new range of, of uh, this new, new additional regime, which corresponds to putting the Fermi level higher in energy. So also importantly, the effect was even higher, 25 nanometers for longer. So to understand more quantitatively what was going on, we uh, uh, performed ARPES. So we measured the band structure in collaboration with a group from Geneva and with a group from Halle in Germany. Uh, we had some, some theoretical calculation to fit the RPS data with a tight landing model and then use this um, deduced band structure to compute the Edelstein effect. So you can see the band structure of, uh, of uh, our uh, SCO2 decks. It's quite complicated. So we have different circular Fermi surfaces. And then we have these two elliptical Fermi surfaces. So the circular Fermi surfaces correspond to T2G DXY state from titanium. And these elliptical Fermi surfaces correspond to XZYZ orbitals. This is what uh, we can see from the dispersion. So this is the energy, uh, the, the, the contrast as a function of with the energy and the momentum. So we see the dispersion. We can recognize the onset of these parabolic bands here, corresponding to this part. And then we have this parabolic band with a lower mass, a higher, a lower mass, and in, and here higher mass. We see that we have interactions between the bands. We see some kind of body crossings, and uh, when we take a, a cut along this other direction, we see another uh, set of bands. And importantly, we if we now take a cut along this direction, which we call delta. We have something very peculiar that comes out of the calculations. We don't have, unfortunately, the resolution to see that experimentally, but the calculation predict that we should have some avoided topological crossing. Uh, and this is very clear. If we zoom from the, in the calculation, we have this topologically non-trivial avoided crossing with band inversion, a little bit like what happens in topological insulators. And we expect that when we position the family level just there, we will have a larger, a large, uh, increase in the spin to charge conduction efficiency. So equipped with this data, our colleagues from, from Halle, our foundation colleagues, calculated the Edelstein effect for each pair of band. So we have one, one blue pair. You see that each band is split in two. Each, each pair is split in two. That corresponds for spin up and spin down. And the splitting is relatively small. Then we have another, another, another pair, orange, green, and and uh, purple. So these are the results, and I'm going to take you slowly through, uh, through all of them. So let's have a look at what happens when we start at relatively low energy. So we put the Fermi level so that it only intersects one band. So we, this is the simplest situation. We are intersecting here the, the purple pair of band. And you can see the effect is very small. This purple band has a very small contribution. So let's move on. So we apply a larger gate voltage, if you wish. The, the Fermi level is, is, is moving up. We start to populate the second band, which is also of the XY character, but it has a stronger um, Edelstein effect. So we start to see an increase in the total efficiency. I forgot to mention that these traces correspond to the contribution for each band pair. And the red is the sum of the contribution for the four pairs. Okay. So basically, what we measure is corresponds to the sum. So we move, we move further up, and uh, we reach a point where this uh, orange band starts to contribute. 
and it has a larger mass. It is a X, X, Y, Z band. And this band has negative rushback coefficient. So basically, it contributes opposite, oppositely, it competes with the other first two bands. And so this produces a maximum and then a decrease. Okay. We continue to increase. And then we reach a point here where we see that we have this uh, first body crossing, which we can see here. And if we zoom in, we see that it corresponds to a rush bus, typical rush bus spin orbit coupling with large. Uh, spin density with a given sign for one contour and spin density with the op opposite sign for the other contour. So this would be, for instance, spin up, spin down. Okay, so we have a large effect expected. We move on into the, we move further up, and then we reach the point when we uh, uh, we reach this topological body crossing, which is here. Uh, and here there's something quite uh, peculiar that occurs. Actually, we see the band splitting again, but instead of having dark blue and dark red, which correspond to a full spin up or full spin down, we see that we have a large dark blue for one, but for the other band, we have almost zero here, almost white. So this means that the spin expectation value in absolute value is very different. Here we have a large spin, the arrow of the spin, if you wish, in the contour is, is long, and here it's almost zero. So there's a very poor compensation from one band from the pair by the other pair, the other band. And so the, the conversion is very efficient. So this is a very unusual case, which is different, very different, is not uh, correspond, not, not at all to the classical Rajba, uh, Rajba situation. Uh, and it's a consequence of the multi-orbital nature of the two deck with uh, x, y, and x, z, y, z orbitals. So now we can compare the result of the calculation in red with our experimental results. And we see that we have a pretty good agreement. And at least we reproduce the positive and negative maxima uh, and, and uh, that, that we see with the different amplitudes. Uh, so we, with these calculations, we are able to um, capture the physics of spin to chart conversion in this complicated system, thanks to our theoretician improvements. So the results I've shown so far were at low temperature, but of course, if we come back to the meso device, we needed to work at room temperature and the effect is much smaller, unfortunately, at uh, room temperature, but it is not zero. We have an efficiency of about 0 0.5 nanometer for the addition length. And so this is much lower, but what is, uh, good news, if you wish, is that um, at the end of the day, we want the, uh, the meso device, we need, need to produce an output voltage. And so the resistance of the, the spin orbit material also matters a lot. So uh, here we are, uh, the two deg are advantageous because the resistance is very high compared to platinum or other metallic system. And in fact, we can estimate that uh, this uh, output signal corresponds to a possible voltage output of about 10 millivolts, which is still one order of magnitude off from the goal of the meso device, but it's still about two orders of magnitude higher than what can be achieved with uh, platinum, for instance. So this is a very promising result. Okay, so let me move on and now we'll switch to charge to spin conversion. This is about the direct Ehlerstein effect. So you remember, this is the situation that occurs when we apply a charge current and we generate a transverse spin density, transverse magnetization, if you wish. So we are going to probe this effect by uh, doing simple magnetotransport experiments. Uh, we measure the longitudinal resistance and we uh, rotate the magnetic field in the plane. And basically the idea is that when we are going to apply the magnetic field parallel or anti-parallel to the uh, spin density, which is generated along Y, as you remember. So transverse to the, to the current, the signal is going to be different. Magnetic field parallel to the spin density will have a given resistance. Magnetic field anti-parallel to the spin density, a different resistance. So this is going to produce a unidirectional magneto resistance effect. So this has been observed previously in uh, topological insulators, and there was a report uh, in LAUSTO as well, 
just while we were uh, writing our own paper. Uh, but in the case of LASTO, there was not clear a uh, model. So we collaborated with uh, Anna Dirdal from Porsdan, and she uh, developed uh, a model to uh, incorporate the role of the, the existence of this transverse spin density uh, and its influence on the relaxation rates. And uh, basically, she uh, arrived at an expression for the transverse, uh, the longitudinal resistivity, which uh, includes these two terms. What, this one is the unidirectional term, and there is a, an additional quadratic term. So this one is the period that goes with sine of theta or cos, cos theta, depending. And this is really unidirectional. And this one is proportional to cosine two theta. So it's, uni, it's uniactual. It's a little bit like the AMR of a magnet, but with a different origin. What is important is that here, this effect, this term is proportional to the Rushback coefficient alpha. And it is linear with the current and linear with the magnetic field. This is why it's often called the bilinear magnetoresistance resistance effect. And this one is proportional to the square of the magnetic field. So it's quadratic, called the quadratic MR, QMR. And basically what is interesting is that if you extract the amplitude of these two terms and you take the ratio, the ratio is going to be proportional to the rushback coefficient over the Fermi energy. So your these simple transport measurements can allow to estimate quantitatively the value of the rushback coefficient. So we work with a, a, a roll bar pattern here by IBM lithography, but it works also if you do it by optical lithography. This today is, is nice at a nice metallicity after patterning. And when we measure the angle dependence of the resistance, we see that we have the superposition of a quadratic term that goes with the sinus two theta or cosinus two theta. And then we have a sinus theta term that changes sign when we measure at positive or negative current. Because of course, when we change the sign of the current, we we change the sign of the spin density. If the current is along x, the spin density is going to be along y, for instance. If the current is along minus x, the spin density is going to be along minus y. So we can do the subtract or add these uh, traces for positive and negative currents to uh, isolate the, uh, each of these two terms. And you can see here the, the, the dependence of the quadratic term for different gate voltages. I want to mention that this case with the square of the magnetic field as expected. And it also depends strongly with the gate and the magnetic field. And this is the unidirectional term, which has this nice unidirectional term, that's nice uh, uh, sine of theta term. And uh, scales linearly with the magnetic field and linearly with the current, and also depends strongly on the gate. So equipped with this data, we can um, uh, extract the value of the rushback coefficient. And this is what is shown here. So these are the, the black points. The uh, open uh, black dots uh, corresponds to uh, the value of the rushback coefficient extracted from a weak anti-localization on the same device, also measured as a function of the gate. So there is a narrow range where we can extract alpha r from both techniques, and we have a pretty good agreement. But interestingly, our new method allows to, uh, to capture what goes on at higher current density, and in particular, uh, the action here where the, um, uh, we have this, this maximum. And hopefully, if we had been able to go to higher voltages, we would have seen a change of sign similar to the change of sign that we saw in the case of uh, the spin to charge conversion effect I showed before. So this point here, the Lichitz point, is basically uh, the point where you start to populate the heavy band. Remember, there's a series of light bands, x, y. And then at some point, you start to populate the x, z, y, z band, which are heavier. So this is called the Lichitz point. And uh, we can compare the results from uh, experiment with results from theory. We can locate the position of the Lichitz point. And we can see that the, the rushback coefficient, uh, the effective rushback coefficient, uh, increases and shows the maximum pretty much in agreement with what we saw here uh, in the experiments. So this is a new method that uh, we can use to estimate the rushback coefficient, which is relatively easy to implement and more broadly applicable than weak anti-localization. So now moving to the third part of, uh, of the talk. Uh, spin to charge interconversion in plana uh, STU nano devices. So here we use the same kind of uh, whole bar that I, I, I showed before. 
but we use a different measurement geometry, which is very important. So here we are going to inject the current in one arm, and we are going to pick up the voltage in the second arm. And basically what is going to happen is that when we run a current in the arm on the right, we will generate a spin current that will flow in the channel to the left. And then this spin current will arrive at, the, at this crossing between the, with the second arm and be reconverted into a charge signal and pick up by the voltage contact. So we will do charge to spin conversion, spin transport and spin to charge conversion. And we can apply a gate to see how all this is affected by the gate. So a priori, we don't know which of these two mechanisms, which I mentioned at the beginning, is going to be dominant. In one case, we could have the direct Lichtenstein effect uh, playing a role. So we generate a, a current, we apply a current, we generate a spin density. The spin density is going to diffuse sideways, and this corresponds to the generation of a spin current, which is going to travel in the channel, and the spins in this case are going to be oriented along Y. There is a second possibility from the 2D spin hole effect that would correspond to the generation directly of a spin current that will move in the channel, travel towards the second arm, and in this case, the spin will be pointing along Z. So we will, uh, we will do experiments to distinguish between the two and tell uh, which is the direction of the spins, and as a result, uh, if, this, if this effect or that effect are dominant, is dominant. So because we don't have any ferromagnet here, uh, we need uh, to apply a magnetic field and use the Handler effect to detect the spin signal. Huh? Because you could also imagine that you have some signal here that would arrive at the second arm that is just pure charge signal that has nothing to do with spin. So in this case, we apply a magnetic field transverse to the um, direction along which we think the spins are going to be pointing. And this magnetic field will cause the spins to process incoherently and eventually the all spin information will be lost and any spin signal will disappear. Typically, this will uh, be seen as a decaying magnetic resistance with a Lorentzian shape. So here we go, let me show you the results. So these are measurements at zero gate for different devices with different channel length. So you see that we do see a Lorentz independence. You can see the fit in with the dotted, uh, the dotted line. And we see it for all four devices. And you have an exponential decay of the spin signal as we expect. And from that, we can deduce a spin diffusion length of about 900 nanometers. Uh, we can then use the device with two micron channel length and apply a gate and we see the same kind of data at different gates but the uh, signal changes its, its amplitude and we can plot here the maximum amplitude as a function of the gate we see that we have a maximum and then a decrease and this is done for the magnetic field applied along x so this is not enough to tell if we are uh, seeing the Edelstein effect or the 2D spin hole because uh, X is perpendicular to both Y and Z, right? So we need to repeat the measurements. Now we apply the magnetic field along Y and we see more or less the same kind of signal, same amplitude, relatively, relatively similar gate dependence. And so this is telling us that the spins are pointing along Z, perpendicular to the magnetic field in these two experiments. So this tells us that what we are seeing here is the um, 2D spin hole effect, not the Edelstein effect. And uh, probably, we don't have a clear answer for that, but probably because the spin uh, lifetime along Z is longer than the spin lifetime along Y. Uh, we can then convert this amplitude into spin hole angles, and we can extract uh, spin hole angles quite large, up to 40%. And that are strongly depending on the gate by uh, one other magnitude. So this is also a remarkable result, this strong tunability of the uh, spin hole angle. So I'm coming to the last part of the talk, which is going to be a little bit different here. We are going to introduce uh, fair electricity as a new degree of freedom in spin orbit trainings. So this comes from the, the idea that I will present in this slide. So suppose that you uh, take a fair electric, its polarization can be oriented towards the top or towards the bottom, and uh, you uh, grow on top a spin orbit material. So with the ferroelectric, you can accumulate or deplete charge 
into the spin orbit material, and this will create, in principle, an electric field over the uh, Thomas Fermi uh, screening length uh, of the spin orbit material. You will create an electric field whose sign will depend on the direction of the ferritic polarization, right? And if you remember the expression I showed you for the Rush Hamiltonian, if you switch the direction of the electric, the electric field, Z, basically you will change the chirality of the spin contours. So you, you will have a Rush state here whose chirality will depend on the direction of electric polarization. So you see here that the outer contour will have clarity that could be, for instance, counterclockwise, and here it will be clockwise. As a result, when you inject spins into the system, you will, in this case, produce a charge current pointing to the left or here pointing to the right. So there's a number of material systems that you can think of to realize this, but uh, since we have quite high efficiencies with the STO2 decks, we continue to work with them and we took advantage of um, have a feature of STO that is uh, known since the many years, since the 50s even, 1950s. When you apply a very large electric field to STO, you can turn it into a, a ferroelectric, or you can induce a ferroelectric like state. And this is visible here. So he, these are polarization measurements. We have a bottom electrode, which is our, our gate electrode, and we have a top electrode, which is our two deg. When we apply, uh, we measure the polarization as a function of the electric field. Initially, we have a linear dependence, but beyond a certain threshold, we start to see a clear hysteresis loops, clear for electric uh, behavior. Uh, we can study this effect as a function of temperature, and we find that the TC is about 50K, in very good agreement with results from the literature. This is from that paper from 1995. So this is not anything new. But what is new is that then we can uh, put permalloy on top and see how this ferroelectric state influences the spin to charge conversion process. So we can, uh, this is what we measure initially at zero gate, but we can pull the system positively. We have negative conversion. We go back to remanence, still negative conversion. We apply now negative voltage. We have positive conversion. Go back to remanence, positive conversion. So different from the previous remanence state. And when we go back to 200 volts, we will re recover something similar to what we have here. So we can do the full cycle, and you can see that we have a clear hysteretic dependence of the current that is produced uh, when we do spin pumping through the inverse Edelstein effect. So instead of uh, changing the direction of the magnetization by a magnetic field that would cause the sign of the charge current be reversed, as I mentioned. Now, we don't do anything with the magnetic field. We change the direction of the ferritic polarization and the sign of the current that is produced is reversed. So you can see that this opens a lot of interesting possibility for spintronics. You can do the same thing as you did with the magnetic field, but now with an electric field with much lower consumption, of course. So we check that we can cycle across these uh, different remanences several times, and also that the effect disappears more or less at the ferroelectric TC. So this is again good indication that this is this uh, hysteretic dependence of the spin to charge conversion effect is really driven by ferroelectricity. So I'm coming to my to my conclusion. So I hope I've shown you that these STO two decks are really fantastic material for spin orbitronics. They uh, can interconvert charge and spin current with very high efficiency, with a strong modulability by the gate. Um, they are promising to build up Intel's mesos transistor, although there's a long way to go still, of course. And they uh, may be key to develop a true power, uh, power computing devices based on spin, especially if you introduce for electricity at this new degree of freedom that is very promising for low power consumption. Okay, so this is the end of my talk. Thank you very much for your attention. I can take questions for the next uh, 10 minutes or so. Thank you so much, uh, Manuel, for this excellent overview of your recent uh, endeavors and really nice work with 2D materials. So uh, Thanks. without losing in time, we will take the questions now. So first question by, uh, I think, Mohindra from Singapore. Uh, Mohindra, you want to ask your question or should I read it? 
Oh, sorry, I just, yeah. Yeah, please, go ahead. Uh, I think he partly, hi, Manuel, this is Mahindran from NUS. Hi. Yeah. Uh, I think you partly answered the first question. Uh, I was wondering that whether uh, the seven Kelvin is necessary and uh, what happens uh, for this effect at the room temperature. The, the... Yeah, so the, the effect is much smaller at room temperature. That's mostly because we think it's because the, the momentum relaxation time decreases with temperature. So mm -hmm. it's typically uh, two orders of magnitude lower at room temperature than at low temperature. So the effect decreases from maybe uh, yeah. Okay, so uh, how, how does it differ upon the frequency of the microwave radiation? Is it a fixed frequency, what, what you have used? Yeah, so for this experiment, we work with the microwave cavity, so there's a fixed frequency. Uh, other groups have uh, done the same kind of experiments in, uh, in strip line. I'm not mm -hmm. sure exactly how this depends on the frequency in their case, but the result they obtain in terms of efficiency is on the same ballpark about a few uh, nanometers for the Edelshan lamp. Okay, thanks. I think one more question I had was, um, uh, well, so this unidirectional MR, which you have seen, yeah. again, was it measured with a direct current? So we can, we do both. So we can measure with DC. Uh, in this case, you need relatively high signal to be able to, uh, detect the um, unidirectional term because sometimes the quadratic term dominates mm. but you can also do it in ac so in this case you measure at uh, 1f and 2f or 1 omega 2 omega and then the signal uh, the unidirectional signal shows up in the 2 omega term and then you need to be careful that you exclude the thermal effects by yeah. measuring the transverse signal as well um, so typically we measure the, the transverse the xy signal at 2 omega and we check that it is um, weak compared to the, you know, we have to play with, to compare the amplitude of the 2F signal along XX and XY with the aspect ratio of the whole bar. And we, we confirm that uh, in all our experiments so far, we confirm that it is, uh, the effect is dominated uh, by uh, a lot. So, by so, the, so, uh, the, so AC is more trustable, right? Excuse me? The AC method is more trustable um, that it's, uh, I'm not sure it's more trustable because you could do the same experiment also uh, all in DC, but uh, you get better data uh, and um, and you can, uh, for instance, if you want to measure at low magnetic field or low current, you can still get some signal in this in AC while in DC the effect is very small. It's uh, hard to measure. Okay. So okay. Now we now we measure mostly with with AC. Okay. Uh, Shubhaga, can I ask one last question? Yeah. Actually, there are not many questions here. So uh, my question is connected to the last part. Uh, does the bulk STO become spheroelectric at a high electric field? Yes, yes, yes. We think it's really the bulk of STO that becomes spheroelectric, not just the interface. Uh, this mm -hmm. can be seen by, uh, you know, you can, we can do Raman spectroscopy, for instance, that probes, uh, you know, relatively thick uh, region in the STO. And we see that there is a, um, there is a clear on, on set of uh, uh, peaks that uh, are typical of uh, induction uh, symmetry broken uh, systems. Okay. Okay. Thanks very much. Yeah. Yeah. So you by any right chance on, uh, did try on the European titanate? So excuse me? Did, did you try on European titanate, which is on the verge of uh, becoming ferroelectric? EUTIO3. Uh, no. oh, we didn't try to use the ferroelectric properties of European titanate. Huh? But STO okay. is very close to being ferroelectric itself. We are also working, I didn't show the results here, but we are also working with a calcium substituted transom titanate. If mm. you work with 1% of calcium, uh, we typically you already have ferroelectricity with a TC about 30 Kelvin. So we are also working on that. Huh? Then you don't need okay. to apply a large electric field to use the ferroelectric state. It's already there. Okay, thanks very much. Okay, okay. thank Mahindra. Uh, so there is a talk by Pushpendra. Pushpendra, can you please unmute and ask? Hello, sir. It's a very nice talk, sir. Uh, sir, you have shown that when you apply negative gate voltage, that time measured voltage have same amplitude. But when you apply positive gate voltage, then the, that time measured voltage is uh, varying. Why is so? Yeah, so... Um... 
Okay, so I, so you're talking about the first part of the talk, right? Yes, we're on slide number 20. Okay. 20 or 21 something. Yeah, actually maybe, yeah, okay. So this all has to do with the, the electronic structure of the STO. Huh? So basically, um, suppose that you start at uh, zero voltage uh, when the family level is here. Okay, because that sample that uh, you're talking about had a much lower current density than this one that we are looking at. So the family level was maybe somewhere here. If we go to negative gate voltage, we deplete. So we stay in this thing, nothing really happens. Okay. If we move up, however, we may reach this point where we have the competition between the first two bands and the orange band with opposite signs. So we see a maximum and then the orange band takes over and we have a decrease. Huh? So this is this has to do with uh, where is the family level when you start. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay, uh, one last question. Uh, there is somebody has raised uh, called Apul. Uh, please unmute and ask. <coughs> yeah. So uh, um, yeah, it was a nice talk. So I would like to know in the last part of your talk, where you are um, uh, using ferroelectric material to uh, uh, using the polarization of ferroelectric material. But yeah, you, yeah. Uh, you you used something different, but uh, you started the story with using ferroelectric material. So I just want to know, is there any difficulty in using this uh, ferroelectric material instead of uh, polarizing the STO by applying such a high field? Yeah, so basically, uh, I mean, of course, in principle, it's possible, and we're also working on that. So you need to combine the ferroelectric material with a system that will have, a, you need to be able to stabilize a nice rush bar state uh, on top of your fair electric. And uh, this is not super easy. Uh, you need to find the right combination of material. And, um, but in principle, you could think of using, you know, PZT and then something else on top, and then you could have that. But the question is, what is the best uh, combination of material to have the same effect? And of course, at room temperature, because of course, here with this uh, fair electric STU, we are limited to having the effect at low temperature. But of course, this is a very promising direction that we are. Yeah, because, because I have seen some studies where people are using BSTO as a ferroelectric material. I mean, it is a kind of a doping they are using as a doping lawyer to induce superconductivity, yeah. BSTO. Yeah, so it could be uh, possible. If you want to do the same thing, you need just need to ensure that your BSTO will be of high enough quality to host a two deck. Yeah. And this has, this puts strong constraint on the crystal quality. You, you, you That's what basically have, uh, it's a growth problem. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. It's, it's a growth problem. Yeah. You need to have a uh, high, high crystal quality. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Davakant. Uh, thanks, Manuel. I think we have to stop now uh, because Manuel has to catch a bus. I'm looking at my watch. Manuel, if you stop sharing, I would like to share my screen and uh, we would like to present a digital plaque for you uh, from our okay. connection. Uh, do you see my screen? Uh, it, it's coming. Yes. Oh, nice. <laughs> All right. So uh, I will. I have some questions, but looking at the watch, I think we need to stop. I will write you later, maybe. So uh, yes, from our please. team, uh, I would like to present this uh, small token of appreciation. I will read it for you. So WTS seminar webinar series on spintronics, nice alumnus of India takes pleasure in presenting this plaque to. Professor Manuel Bibes from University of Paris Saclay, uh, Thales France, in recognition and appreciation for being a valuable speaker to give a lecture on spin charge interconversion with oxide two decks. Thank you so much, Manuel, for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Thank you, everyone, Thank you. for joining. I just want to announce that next week uh, the talk will be by Aurelio Moncho from also France, uh, but it will be on Wednesday, not on Thursday, due to some unavoidable digits. So Wednesday, let's hope uh, I will see most of you or all of you. So with this, please stay safe and uh, have a good night and uh, see you. Bye bye. Bye bye, Manuel. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Bye. Thank bye. You. bye bye. Thank you, everyone.